The Week in Space. CBS News selected color coverage of the mission of Gemini 9. This morning, the second attempt this week to launch astronauts Stafford and Cernan for the start of their three days in space. Reporting from Cape Kennedy, CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good morning, and it is a good morning down here at uh, Cape Kennedy. The skies are virtually clear, certainly far better than they were on Wednesday when they tried to get Gemini 9 up uh, for the second time. The weather downrange, some 1,300 miles out in the Atlantic, where the astronauts would have to land if anything went wrong during the launch phase of the operation today. The weather down there is good, too. The aircraft carrier WASP, which is standing by, reports to us. The astronauts have been in the capsule for over an hour now, waiting for blast off and everything is proceeding on schedule. The voice uh, we hear from Mission Control here at Cape Kennedy is that of Jack King, and he should have an announcement now. This is Gemini Launch Control, T-minus 34 minutes and counting. T-minus 34, all still going excellently at Launch Complex 19 in our Gemini 9 countdown. As the ATDA target continues to swing around on its 29th revolution. At this point in the countdown, we're going through a series of flight control checks with the Gemini launch vehicle and overall telemetry checks between the launch vehicle and the Air Force, the Air Force Eastern Test Range tracking elements. During this phase of the count also, the automatic sequencer, the so-called Master Operations Control System, has come into effect on the Gemini countdown. This is a sequencer that controls and commands many of the actions that will occur during over the final phases of the count. Uh, it will command some 10 activities and monitor some 25 other functions until we get to the T-minus 5 minute mark, and then we have a completely automatic operation from T-minus 5 down through ignition and liftoff. All systems and all checkouts still going very well at the pad at the present time at T-minus 32 minutes and 50 seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. So that you will not be confused as this countdown goes on this morning, let's explain something right now. Uh, the countdown clock you see is a countdown to an 8.39 uh, minute and 33 second launch. That is 39 minutes after 9 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, but uh, there is a 4 minute and 29 second hold built into that count. In other words, the count, as you see it uh, occasionally supered on your screen there, goes down to T minus three minutes, and then stops counting for four minutes and 29 seconds, and then picks up again for a launch at 9.39 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, that uh, built-in hold is to permit last-minute adjustments uh, in the flight path of the Titan rocket and uh, Gemini spacecraft it will carry aloft uh, to meet on the third orbit with the augmented target docking adapter. Uh, that uh, ship that went up on Wednesday and unmanned waits out in space. This, as you know, is a three-day flight to include some uh, nine rendezvous and dockings. It is hoped if all is going well uh, with the uh, spacecraft. And uh, tomorrow morning, the most dramatic part of the flight, the highlight dramatically at any rate, a two-and-a-half-hour space walk by 32-year-old astronaut Eugene Cernan. But we said that uh, augmented target uh, docking adapter, which has uh, taken the place of the Agena, uh, which was not put into orbit on May 17th through the failure of its Atlas booster, that uh, ATDA is now on its 29th revolution and will be back over the uh, Cape here at uh, 8.39. She's been uh, patiently orbiting uh, the Earth for two days now, uh, right on exactly on a perfect uh, circular orbit, just where she's supposed to be uh, for the rendezvous with these two astronauts. But the question is, is she the same girl they expected to meet out there in space? Perhaps she's not. The problem is in this shroud, which uh, encompassed the uh, target adapter as it took off uh, from uh, the Cape here on Wednesday morning, a shroud which was to protect it uh, in the uh, launch phase of the operation, and then was supposed to drop off as the target adapter got into orbit. The question is, did that shroud drop off? If, if it did not, it would mean that it would be difficult, uh, it would be impossible, in fact, to dock 
with uh, the uh, target. The rendezvous can still take place, the space walk can still take place, but the docking practice, uh, which was supposed to be conducted by Stafford and Cernan, would have to be passed over. And uh, that would be another blow to our space program, and as much as the first uh, several series of docking practices were supposed to have taken place by Armstrong and Scott during the Gemini 8 flight, when they had to come back through that uh, stuck thruster problem early, they didn't get uh, but one docking practice, and if there were none on this Gemini 9 flight, it means we'll be really two flights behind in this docking practice. However, on the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, Chris Kraft, uh, the, the flight director in Houston, has uh, said that he does not consider that a vital part of this function, since uh, Armstrong and Scott proved that docking is just exactly what they expected it to be, and we can now do our docking practice in the trainer. They would like to get it in space. Dave Schumacher, out at the McDonnell Aircraft in uh, St. Louis, can tell us more about that shroud and the ATDA with the use of uh, some models we've got out there. Dave? Well, Walter, this is the way we think the ATDA does not look this morning. That is, with the shroud in place, this bullet-shaped cover. But uh, in any event, let's take it in order. Bob Sharp, of course, is with me, and Bob is the man who can really talk about it. Uh, Bob, uh, as I say, let's take things in order. Uh, what is the shroud? What's it supposed to do? And uh, what's supposed to happen to it? Well, the shroud, just like it looks there, is a uh, streamlined device to uh, cut down the drag and the air resistance uh, during the uh, launch of the uh, ATDA. So then uh, once the uh, vehicle gets out of the atmosphere, the uh, shroud is blown off in two sections. And uh, this is accomplished by a timing sequence, uh, which occurs during liftoff. It's like turning your oven on and off with an automatic timer. All right, well, let's assume we've uh, reached that point in the launch. They, uh, they offered to put some explosive uh, charges in here, Walter, but uh, we passed that. There it comes. Actually, it separates in two sections this way and then blows away. What if uh, when uh, Cernan and Stafford get up there, uh, Bob, they find that it's uh, still fully in place? What will they do? Well, they'll probably uh, leave it alone then, uh, leave it alone during the... Uh uh, extra vehicular portion of the mission, and of course, we won't be able to dock because the uh, cone is not exposed. Mm. Uh, would, would it be dangerous, say, to get around there, and uh, is, is the explosive charge big enough? Could somebody get hurt with it? Uh, I'm not really that uh, familiar familiar with the explosive charge in there or the shape of it. Uh, I would say that probably they would uh, stay away from it. I don't know what the impact of it is. If it is uh, substantial, uh, it could, uh, could be dangerous. Well, now, what if uh, the uh, shroud should be in a position like this that is cocked? It's pretty obvious uh, that the, uh, the charges have gone off and that somehow or other it's hung up. Uh, then I'd say it uh, shouldn't be any problem at all. You could go out there and knock it away with, probably with the nose of the spacecraft or with an EVA uh, astronaut, either one. Mm -hmm. you, you just go up and bang away at it. Just uh, give it a slight kick with the nose. Of course, the nose is, uh, of the spacecraft is strong enough to withstand uh, uh, docking, and it wouldn't be any trouble to uh, go up there and just give it a little kick. What well, we used to nuts. call uh, Brogan maintenance in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Something Bob? like that. Bob Sharp? Yes. Uh, this is Walter Cronkite. Yesterday at the uh, yesterday evening briefing, uh, they suggested that they didn't think they'd want to fiddle with that shroud if it seemed to be hanging there, hung up on a cable or something of the kind. Uh, uh, apparently, they just uh, they don't think the docking is so important that they'd uh, want to play with it. Of course, as we know, this operation today, if that shroud is on there at all, is going to be very much of a so-called real-time situation, which I kind of suspect these fellows like. In other words, it's not going to be strictly by the book, but they're going to make up their mind when they get there. Well, uh, I think that's uh, one more sign of uh, how pilots are really flying this mission. I think really it will be up to Stafford and Cernan when they take a look at it uh, to decide whether they think they can risk it or not. I think so. They'll, they'll be in the best position of anybody in the world to uh, make a, a judgment on that. And so uh, uh, that's the real value of having a man in the spacecraft to uh, not to program things. If you, you can program things, uh, all like we did in Surveyor there, which is a, a beautiful job, but when it comes to the unexplained or the unknown items there to ascertain what's going on, uh, a, uh, a pilot or a crew in that uh, spacecraft really pays off. <laughs> That's one interesting fact, too, you know, uh, Cernan will be carrying, uh, so to speak, in his hip pocket a pair of wire cutters. Uh, yeah. they're, they're there for the purpose of cutting loose those straps which they observed on the Gemini 6s and 
things that uh, uh, that uh, trail behind the adapter, the back end of the uh, spacecraft in orbit, uh, he's going to cut those away or try to with the wire cutters as part of his EVA exercise, his extravehicular activity. Uh, and uh, uh, there is some suggestion around the Cape here, not official by any means, but just a little speculation that he might just take those wire cutters and cut away that shroud. There is one thing other, though, if I may mention it, uh, gentlemen, there, there are, though that thing is spring-loaded, uh, as well as uh, pyrotechnically loaded. That is, there are explosive bolts, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but there are explosive bolts that blow away a ring that holds that shroud on there. Uh, that is the signal they did not get at Houston that makes them worry about the shroud being there. They did not get the signal that the explosive bolts had blown. Uh, However, they, uh, and that would be a worry if an astronaut were going too close to that thing that those bolts might blow, except that they do have the capability of uh, cutting off the battery power to those squibs uh, to keep them from blowing. But there are also these spring-loaded devices which push the shroud away, and they say that those push it away at a speed of about uh, two and a half or three miles an hour. Uh, and they are concerned that if we had an astronaut floating around there and the spring loading suddenly went and the thing pushed away at that speed, it could cause some difficulty. Waller, Bob is pretty sure uh, that uh, this sequence has worked as uh, scheduled. Uh, what are your reasons for that, Tom? Well, I believe at the time the shroud was supposed to jettison uh, the other day right after liftoff, they had two indications there. One was a uh, temperature rise on another telemetry channel. Uh, a temperature rise where in here? Uh, down in the uh, cone area there, yes, which would indicate that the sun was probably shining on that area and uh, uh, was absorbing some heat. Uh, the other at that time is that when the shroud goes off, of course, uh, if it goes off a little bit unevenly, you'll get a kick on the nose and uh, change the rate. So the rate of uh, tumbling of the uh, vehicle was also observed on another channel. Waller? Right. Uh, well, now, now, let's review what happens here this morning. Astronaut Stafford and Cernan in their third attempt to get aloft uh, with Gemini 9 are scheduled to go now uh, in about... Uh, 23 minutes from now uh, in the launch of Gemini 9. They'll go up and on the third orbit this afternoon they hope to rendezvous uh, with an unmanned target uh, that has been circling since Wednesday's launch here and will be passing overhead uh, starting its 30th revolution at the time they lift off. By the third revolution, after a 70,000 mile chase three times around the Earth, uh, they uh, expect to be able to meet up with that target and perhaps, if it does not have the shroud on it, if it's in the configuration and the uh, attitude they expect, they expect to dock with it at that time. Uh, that would be around uh, uh, 2.05 uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Time this afternoon. Uh, if the shroud is uh, not there, they will carry out their normal program, which will include one more docking uh, today, and then tomorrow morning the spacewalk with another docking uh, maneuver to follow that, and recovery uh, landing in the Pacific on Monday morning. CBS News color coverage of the launch of Gemini 9 will continue in a moment. As America's Gemini heroes whirl through space, they take along equipment specially designed for the Gemini space trips. Among the gear selected was this special toothbrush made by the makers of Picopay toothbrushes. This unique brush is just like the Picopay brush you'd use at home, except it's made with a specially resistant material, material to stand up to the high temperatures and oxygen levels of space. Just as this special Picopay brush goes along on Gemini flights, so this regular Picopay has become the toothbrush more dentists recommend. You see, Picopay was professionally designed to do the best possible job of cleaning your teeth. Every feature was designed to fight cavities. Handle, head, even the tufts are tapered deeper to clean deeper where cavities often start. So remember, for the best possible job of cleaning your teeth, Get PicoPay, the toothbrush recommended by more dentists. This is the scene earlier this morning, uh, just about uh, an hour and a half ago, when Stafford and Cernan, for the third time, uh, went aloft in that elevator uh, to uh, try to get off on Gemini 9. That's Deke Slayton uh, without the helmet on, without the hat, who uh, you saw 
carrying a baton-like device. That turned out to be a long uh, replica, supposedly, of a match stick given to the launch director, allegedly to help light the rocket for takeoff.